All right, well, thank you for coming, everyone, and taking uh, time out of your busy days. So I'd like to thank Canon for putting this on today. I love nothing more than printing my own work, and we're going to go through over the next 45 minutes, and we're going to talk about printing. Obviously, I'm not going to be able to show you how to do it in that short time frame, and I'm not going to be able to teach you how to print in that short time frame, because there's a little bit more to it. However, I'll just show some of my commercial work while, we're, while I'm talking at the start. However, I'm hoping that I can demystify it a little bit so that you can understand why we print and how we print the way that we do in order to get the results that, we, that we're getting. So printing is not a uh, near enough is good enough. I was talking to the guys before and what I'm going to show you now is an ICC profiled printing workflow. And hopefully by the end of it, you'll have enough knowledge to understand what these things in the menus mean and what they will do. But what that means is we can print to these Canon printers using their PicBridge uh, application or just the automatic settings, and you will get a reasonable a result. But will you match what you're seeing on the screen? There's nothing worse than, you know, got a shot and someone's wearing a beautiful fluffy red jumper and it comes out, bleh. All right, so profiling is going to be able to nail those colours as best as they can. And there are some caveats on that, which we'll talk about as we go through. So let's make a start. So printing, why print your own work? Quality. I put in my first uh, inkjet. I'm going to call it G-Clay printer today, and I'll tell you why a little bit down the track. But I call them G-Clay to separate them from inkjet. So Alwyn talked about going to Officeworks and, and picking a printer off the shelf there and taking it home. Most of those are inkjet printers. What we're talking here today with these Canon printers, they're a cut above that. They're designed specifically for photography to produce photographic tonality, tonal ranges and so forth, and they use a different ink set that we'll get into. So just for no other reason, to distinguish between the two, we'll call them G-Clay printers. But what G-Clay printers do is they give us the quality that we used to pay a professional lab to, to give us. In actual fact, in a lot of cases, they exceed what you'd get from a professional lab in terms of the old photographic process, like the, the, the Kodak RA4 and so forth, because they're a little bit more targeted. So quality is number one. Okay, Number two, control. Like I said about it's probably more than 15 years ago, actually. I put in a printer about this size into my studio, and I've never been to another lab since because I'm getting the quality that I need straight away. Admittedly, printers have improved over the years, and I've upgraded along the path, but even 15 years ago, I felt that I was getting better than what I was achieving from my local lab. Uh, so I've never looked back. So control is another one. Convenience. As a professional photographer, I don't have to leave my studio. I need to do a print. I've got it all colour managed and set up. I go in, I just push the button and print it. Off I go. So I had a woman come in this morning who wants me to print an exhibition. She had her files with her. I said, look, I'll just quickly run one out so you can see the sort of quality to expect. That is so convenient. Archive. You know, in this modern day and age where everything has a camera built in, you know, from your, your drones, your mobile phones, your iPads, there's more photos being taken than at any point in history. However, this generation will go down as the one that has the least, uh, the smallest photographic archive because no one's printing them. It's great to have them on the phone, but what if you lose your phone down the toilet or something like that? There goes all your images. Yes, you can put them in the cloud. Um, there's nothing like printing them. You print them, they're going to be here for generations. And uh, people like to actually feel and hold a print, much nicer than looking at an image on an iPad. They're all good ways, but they're not going to be there forever. So to create art, I, I do my own fine art prints. And uh, with all the different paper types that are available now, we can really create art. It doesn't have to be just a straight photograph. You can do things. And, and not that I'm into this, but I know someone who has an application that, that converts their photographs into oil paintings. And then he prints them out on canvas. So it just puts an effect on it. Now, if you like that sort of thing, great. But I do, I do fine art archival prints that I sell, and I make a good supplement to my, uh, to my commercial photography income by doing that. That's all as a result of having these printers in my studio and, and getting my head around them. And to sell. You know, I've got one print now that's a limited edition that's, I think if I sell the next one, I will have made $30,000 out of one photograph. That's more than what I get paid to shoot commercially. It's all because I've got a printer, and it's a photo that I took for me, just for the fun of it. So it can be 
something that doesn't have to be big, it can be small in a little frame. I went to Europe last year with my wife because my background's Dutch, obviously by the name, and what do we get our, our family that we stay with as a little gift? So I just went to Ikea and got some little frames and I printed off some of my personal work and we laid them all in the bottom of the suitcase and we gave them all a gift. They were wrapped. They really loved it. You know, I couldn't wait to get them on the wall. So great gifts. If you're stuck to give your friends a, a nice birthday present or a, or a gift, what about one of your photographs printed nicely in Ikea or little frame? Or I shouldn't say that. They sell frames here too. They'd have a good range downstairs. But very, very easy to do and great gifts and you can sell them. Fun. You know, I always... Actually, I'm reading the wrong slide. I'm, behind, I'm ahead of myself here. I'm reading the slide on the right, but it's the one on the left that's actually up. Fun. There we go. Um, it's fun. Look, I, I was drawn into, the, into photography through the darkroom, and, and I will admit it's not quite the same as watching an image appear in a, in a tray, but it's equally as exciting watching the print come out of the printer and, and watching it come out bit by bit and seeing how it appears in front of you. So it's fun. And photography's fun. Photography, a couple of years ago, um, overtook fishing as the number one hobby in the world. So it is very, very popular. So what sort of, what sort of printer should I get? I talked earlier about, about inkjet versus gicle. All right? Now, gicle is a French word, and I think it means ink squirted through fine nozzle or something like that. Sorry? Ejaculation. There you go. That's what it means. Can you repeat that? Because I'm not going to say that. <laughs> So, um, so when I say gicle, I'm really talking pigment inks. That said, we can get really, really good results from dye-based printers as well. So it depends on your budget. So a dye-based printer is generally a less expensive printer, so they're cheaper. Um, they make very, very snappy images on gloss paper. If you just want to do your, five, your six by four inch photo album prints, that's a perfect solution. And they even make little ones. The Canon make little ones, don't they, just to do that. If you want to do that, that's a really good solution if you want to continue to have a family photo album and put photos in. So um, the difference between that and the next one is that even though the dye-based prints, the archival qualities of the ink have improved somewhat, they're still nowhere near that of a pigment print. And the other thing is they're water-soluble. So if you spill your glass of wine on it, it's going to smudge. All right? Mind you, most prints would be wrecked, but a pigment one wouldn't smudge. It would just be wet. So with pigment inks, okay, they're archival. So depending on what paper you're printing on, they've been, there's a few institutes in the world that can actually uh, fire enough UV and, and so forth at a print on a light bench to determine how long that print would last in normal conditions. Now, how accurate that is, I don't know. But, when they, but compared to other prints that, that have a known lifespan, and when they do the comparison, they're coming up with figures of up to 200 years, depending on the print. Okay. Another good thing about pigment is they're much better for black and white, because unlike the, the dye based, they have interme intermediate grey inks. So you'll have a black, and then you'll have some, some light blacks or some grey inks to help give you a greater tonality with the black and white print. So you get really, really good black and white prints from them. You'll get much better prints on fine art paper with a pigment-based printer. And like I said, they're more durable or water, res uh, water resistant. Oh, actually, someone told me, and I don't know how true it is, but it was a few years ago that the Australian Navy were putting decals on their submarines that they were printing on a plastic film that they were running through a pigment-based inkjet printer, and it was lasting underwater. Now, don't quote me on that. I was told that. You're hearing it third hand. But um, they are quite durable. You don't want to be doing that to your fine art prints, though. So who's, who is familiar with colour management? No one? Okay, I'm just going to gloss over it because colour management is, a, is, is quite a complex subject, but it doesn't need to be. The thing with, with colour management is you only need to know what you need to know. You don't need to have a PhD in colour science. You need to know, know a couple of basic things to use it. And it's been designed so that there is a standard of colour that we can all work with and we can get achievable results. So colour management, uh, I've said here, is the glue that binds it all together. And the heart of colour management is an ICC profile. So ICC stands for International Colour Consortium. And that was a group of industry imaging professionals that got together and said, hey, we've got computers, we've got printers, we've got monitors, and there is no standard for which we can work with each other. We need to create a standard. And they came up with this system of ICC profiling. 
So what are they? What is an ICC profile? Essentially, an ICC profile is a little file that, that resides on your computer, okay, that maps the colour of a particular device, a workspace or a media. And when I say media, I'm meaning printing papers, okay? So what it does is it says, okay, this paper is able to reproduce this much colour, the file that we have has this much colour, and they translate. So, you know, the file's in French, the print's in Italian, it translates it. So it prints it in Italian, essentially, but in colour terms. Does that make sense? I'm, I'm really trying to do it in layman's terms. I don't want to get you too confused. Don't focus too much on it. This slideshow will be made available for you, so you can take it, uh, download it or something. I'm not sure what they're going to do. But um, very simply, they act as a translator to translate the colour information from one device, media or workspace into the colour gamut of another to ensure the most ac accurate reproduction is achievable. So how it works is everything that we use in a digital workflow has what we call a colour gamut. Now, when I set up Photoshop on my computer, I set it up to use the space in which I'm working as Adobe RGB. Now, if you look at this wireframe here, that wireframe is the Adobe RGB colour gamut. And I'm going to show you some prints later on. And I, I wrote a profile for uh, Ilford Textured Cotton Rag, which is an uncoated fine art textured paper. This little blob in the middle of the wireframe is the gamut of colour that that paper can reproduce. So what our profiles do essentially is they go, OK, we've got this much colour in Adobe RGB, we need to get it to fit into that, and they work out the most accurate way of doing that, so that you get a good representation between the two. Does that make sense? I'm trying to keep it simple. There are other things that we have to take into consideration. The next one is, um, I want to just quickly touch on, is colour constancy. Has anyone heard of that before? So the whole weak link in all of this colour management chain is us, and how we perceive colour and how we see colour. And it happens to me, and I've been doing it for years. I could be editing a file at, at midnight, get up in the morning and think, my God, what was I thinking? Because my eyes are letting me down. The system isn't changing. So if we just have a look at this here, this is just very, I'll read this out. Colour constancy is an example of subjective constancy and a feature of the human colour perception system, which ensures that the perceived colour of objects remain relatively constant under varying illumination conditions. So if we've, if we've got something that's white and we put it in the shadow, it's no longer white. It's grey, but our brain tells us it's white. So this is something that we have to work with when we're, when we're working on our printing as well. And to prove that point, I've put this little chart up here. And I want you to have a look at the next slide at what happens. So we've got two dots. Which is the brightest one? Who wants to tell me? Smarty. <laughs> they are. And we've got a grey square at the top and a white square down here. So colour constancy is telling us that it's a white square and a grey square, when in actual fact they're exactly the same colour. The dots are ex exactly the same colour. So I just want you to think about that col co uh, colour constancy uh, theory and keep that in the back of your mind as we go through, because there's a couple of things where it's going to come up uh, moving forward. So the first link in colour management is profiling your monitor. Why would that be the first link, do you think? Exactly. It's at that point that we're making a judgment on the colour of the file, okay, or the colour of the image. Now, in a digital workflow, a colour is made up of, of three sets of numbers. A, a digital number for the red, for the green, and for the blue. That won't change. We take that file and we put it on something else. It's going to interpret those numbers, not what you think you saw on your computer screen. So what we need to make sure is that our computer is displaying the colour that those numbers represent accurately. So that when it goes to the next device, what we've seen is what we would expect to come out of the printer. So in layman's terms, if my printer is way too yellow, all right, and I'm going into Photoshop and I'm taking all that yellow out of the print, by the time I print it, it's going to be a very, very cold print. It's probably going to be on the bluish side because my monitor was wrong and giving me, giving me false feedback. So this thing hanging on the screen here is called the colorimeter. 
The one that I use is an i1 display. All right, so if you just want to read that, I won't repeat what's on the, on the screen. So that's what it looks like. And this is a colorimeter, and a colorimeter is a color management device. It's like a light meter for your monitor that measures color. And we hang it over, and, and I won't go into the ins and outs of how it works. It's very, very simple. Um, if you're serious about printing, whether you're going to print for yourself or you're going to come here and use the print hub, you really should have your screen calibrated. That way you can make accurate, accurate assessments on the screen. If you go down this path, they're $369.95 or $370 bucks here at Michael's. And that will calibrate your screen. It'll also calibrate your projector. So if you've got a home theatre, you can make sure the colour you're getting out of that spot on. There's a couple of things I want you to, to remember. When we, um, and, and like I said, you, this will be made available, available to you. It's very, very easy to calibrate a monitor. It basically gives you the instructions. It tells you what to do next on the screen. Do this next, do that, turn this, do that. But there's a few settings that you need to know to ensure that it's set up correctly for photography. And that's the white balance. So we set our white balance to D65 or 6500 degrees Kelvin. The gamma, so that's where our greys, mid greys sit within the, within the colour spectrum. And that should be set at 2.2. And then we have the luminous or the brightness of the monitor. And I would suggest that you would, you would position that somewhere between 80 and 100. Anyone want to guess why I'm not giving you an ac accurate figure on that? Okay, it's, we just looked at colour constancy. So you think about it. If, you, if you've got your smartphone and you're in this dark room or you're woken up in the middle of the night, how bright does that, monitor, does that screen appear? Compare that now to if you go out on a day like today where it's really sunny and glary, how bright it looks outside. They look completely different. The, mo the, the screen's actually producing the same amount of light. It's just that our perception's completely different based on the lighting around it. So very, very simply, at my studio I have an office upstairs which has big windows. I calibrate my screens up there to 100 degrees candela per square metre. Down in my studio, which is a darkened room, a little bit brighter than this, I have to calibrate that one to 80 degrees candela per square metre, otherwise my prints come out too dark. So basic rule of thumb is if you're calibrating and then you come here and you get a print and you bring it back and you look on your screen and you go, well hang on a minute, it's a lot darker than what it is on my screen, what's that telling you? The print's actually right, what's it telling you about your screen? It's too bright. So you would recalibrate your screen to a darker setting until the print looks much the same. Right. So that again, that's, what that's to do with colour constancy. So monitor viewing conditions are very, very important. It's very important that if you are um, working on your image that, that you have a consistency and you have your monitor in a great viewing location. So things to consider would be the room lighting. You don't want it too bright, you don't want it too dark, you want it average. Lighting variances. You don't want to have your monitor in a room where you've got the window light coming in in the morning, it gets brighter during the day and goes away in the evening because it's varying then your perception of what you're seeing on the screen is going to change. The colour of the room. If you're in a room and all your, all your walls are painted green, that's going to have an effect on what colours you're seeing on your screen. So find a neutral room, preferably a, you know, just a, 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 an off-white room or a, a grey room or, or whatever. The monitor that you see here has a viewing hood around it to try and block some of that reflection coming in from outdoors, which is very, very good. Incidentally, if you're after a really good photographer's monitor at a, at a really good price, the BenQ 27-inch photographer's monitor for the money, I would say, is the best on the market. All right? It's actually designed for photographers and it produces the same, very, very close to the colour gamut that we work with. So there are, there are other brands on the market and I have one of the other brands and this is equally as good, but it's about a third of the price. So they're about a thousand bucks. That's, if anyone was taking notes, that's an SW2700 PT. Colour of your clothing. If I'm sitting in front of the screen with an orange t-shirt on, it's going to be reflecting in the screen. It's going to affect the way I'm seeing things on screen. Fatigue, or fatigue as my niece calls it, is going to affect you too. Like I said earlier, you know, sitting up late at night, 
you're tired, you're not going to see things. So make sure that you're, you're alert and you're refreshed when you're doing critical colour management or density management of your images. That's all well and good, okay? I have a, a client of mine who I do colour management for. I go out and profile her printer. She's got a big 24-inch Canon printer in her studio and she prints all her own work. And she calls me up and she goes, Ian, I've got a real problem with my with my printer. I go, what's wrong? She says, I've had it profiled, my screen's profiled, my prints are constantly coming out too dark. I go, look, that's not a problem, we just need to recalibrate your monitor. So I go out there, I have a look and everything's fine. And I go, let me have a look, let's do a print. So we do a print, and it comes off the printer, and she's in the room about this dark, right, without this spotlight, and she holds up the print, she goes, look, it's too dark. And I'm going, are you for real? I said, come here. And I take her out into the light, and I go, now have a look at it. She goes, oh, it looks good. So where you view your prints is really important too. So if you're going to make an assessment on the quality of your prints, you need to make sure that you're viewing it under a reasonable lighting condition. So these first two shots are in my studio of one of the prints that we're going to hand around today. I have this box which is ISO, industry standard light source, okay, for viewing images. So I will not determine whether my, my prints are too light or too dark anywhere other than in, in this box here. I've got another one which is next to it as well, in either or. These are quite expensive. This is about five or $6,000, this box. But on the far right, there's a thing called a graphlight, um, a colour confidence graphlight. Do you guys have them here? Do you sell them? Do you know? No. You'd be able to get them in, but they're about $100. And they fold up. Have that next to your desk. You do a print, you open it up and you have a look at it. You can see. And it's not only the brightness. It's also the colour of the light and the way the light reacts with the paper. I've got mercury vapours in my studio. If I pull a print out in my studio, they look terrible because of the light and the way it cycles. So viewing conditions are very, very important. So don't criticise a print until you've actually looked at it, or don't critique a print, sorry, until you've actually looked at it under the correct lighting conditions. So now that our screen's calibrated and we sort of understand uh, ICC profiling, and our screen's profile, just, sorry, just on that, I've, I've said monitor calibration and profiling. The reason I've got those two words in there is they are actually two completely different things. So calibration is getting your monitor via the hardware controls on the monitor to a neutral state or a linearized state or to the best that you possibly can before you profile. So calibration is adjusting the hardware. Profiling is actually making a software tweak. And we can profile a monitor without adjusting the hardware or without calibrating, and it will still work. It just means that we're making our profile do a whole lot more work than what it needs to do. So when I say calibrate with modern day LCD and LED monitors, your calibration may be as simple as adjusting the brightness, getting the brightness right, and then do your, cali uh, your profiling. So it's not compl complicated. So now that our screen's calibrated and profiled, we understand that we need to consider where we view our final prints. We can start printing with confidence. But before we need to start, there's one more step in the process. And that's printing profiles. So we've got a language for our monitor. It's converting what's in the file so that we're viewing it correctly. Our editing space, which is in Photoshop, and you would have heard things like Adobe RGB, sRGB, they're editing spaces, all right? They're built into the software that you edit in. But we need to be able to tell this editing space what the printer is able to be reproduce. And that's where a printer profile comes in. And in order to, to demystify that a little bit, we're not actually calibrating the printer. We're calibrating the paper and the ink combination. So we're really calibrating the media or profiling the media. I shouldn't use that word. So I'm going to, at the end, when we're at question time, I'm going to hand a series of prints out so that you can have a look at what I'm talking about. Um, each one of those prints I've created a profile for using this device. This is an i1 um, Pro 2 eye profiler. That's a spectrophotometer or photospectrometer, one or the other. And the other big thing behind it's just a robotic arm that, that does the work for me. Otherwise, I'd have to do it by hand. There's, uh, there's cheaper uh, alternatives, um, but we'll get to. But I, I profile for other people, so I actually offer that as part of my, of, of my service to my clients. If they want their printers profiled, I will do that for them. So where do we get them from? So we're going to do a print. 
we've got a lovely, we've come to Michael's and we've bought one of their wonderful Pro 1000 printers which does beautiful A2 prints. Um, where do we get the profiles from? Firstly, there's a thing called canned profiles and a canned profile is a profile that is an average profile. So when I write a profile, it's a custom profile. I'm profiling that particular printer and I'm measuring that particular printer. With a CAN printer, a CAN profile, depending on who's creating that profile, they might do an average of 10 printers and then create a profile and then they put that on their website and you can download that and use that to print. Printing with a CAN profile will be way better than any other way of printing with the exception of a, can, a custom profile. And, but sometimes it's even better. Sometimes the CAN profile will actually work better than the profile you write yourself. For, for whatever reason. So the first thing you can do is download a CAN profile. So Canon have them on their website, correct? Yep. Ilford have them on there. So if you buy a box of paper, you look at what type of paper it is, you go to the website of the, of the paper manufacturer, you go to where they, their download section and you look for that paper, select your printer model and download the profile. A right. couple of things is really important to know when you do do that, download the instructions of what you need to do with that profile. Because that profile is dependent on some conditions like what base paper they make, they've printed it on. And without, without getting too technical, with Canon it's straightforward. It's a Canon printer, you download one of their profiles, their paper is in the, in the, in the system. But if I'm printing on Ilford, I need to find a Canon type of paper that's going to give me a, the correct result on the, the sorry, I've got to find the, the correct paper setting that will give me the correct lay of ink on the paper. So I might create for, I talked about textured cotton rag before, I've had to go into Canon and choose one of their matte papers that I use as my base. I'm not confusing you, I hope. So what that means is when I download a profile from the Ilford site for textured cotton rag, I need to know what paper setting on the Canon printer they've used as the base, or it might differ. So then you go into the menu and go, okay, this is Ilford paper, but I need to load Canon Fine Art paper as the, as the base. Does that make sense? So that's one of the settings. I'll show you the settings in a minute. But if you do that, you'll get really good result, results. The next option, of course, is to get a custom profile made from someone like myself, um, or there's plenty of people that do it. Or if you have enough experience, you can do it yourself. And there's cheap solutions like uh, X-Rite Color Monkey. That's a little thing, it looks like a, a, an oversized tape measure and you can actually profile your screen with that and you can profile your printer and that works in a very unique way. It gets you to print some charts out, you measure them, it then gets you to print the charts using that measurement and then you measure it again until you actually fine tune it to give you a profile. And they're well under a thousand dollars, Colour Monkey. I profile is about sixteen hundred starting. So printing, we're not actually going to print here, but I'm going to hang around a little bit afterwards. So if anyone wants to ha see a print go through, we can do it out at the Print Hub after, after we're finished here. So I've taken these steps with um, using the software that comes with the Canon printers. It's called Canon Print Studio Pro. It is a standalone piece of software. You don't need Photoshop to use it. You can print without. I've chosen to, to do my little workflow here through Photoshop. So the first thing we do is we open the image in Photoshop. So that's just, that's just a screen grab from my, from my computer. So that's step one. Step two, once we're, made, once we're happy with the colour and everything of the print, we go up to File, Automate, Canon Print Studio Pro. We click on that and that's going to open up the Canon printer interface. I'm going to go through the settings down the side because this really determines what's going to happen with our print from that point on. So we have the printer dialog box open. First thing that we're going to choose is the media type. Now this is what I was talking about before. So I've, which one have I selected here? Um, so I'm, I'm choosing photo, uh, photo paper plus glossy, which is a Canon paper. And I've chosen that because it's a similar surface to the Ilford paper that I'm creating a profile for. So that is my base. So this is what I was talking about before. When you're downloading a profile, you need to find out what the base paper they've used to create the profile is. So I've selected that. I obviously then need to tell it what size paper I'm putting in it. So this is an A3+. 
tell it what tray I'm going to load it into. So we have the option of a manual feed tray or a rear tray. The reason we have to is some fine art papers are quite thick and they won't go through your normal feed tray. So they have an alternative tray where you can put one sheet at a time in and, and you can put thicker paper, fine art paper through. It also um, bends the paper less too, so it comes through on a straighter path, so you can put thicker paper through. So you select which one. And what you'll find with some papers, it won't allow you do it, to do it through the rear tray. It will only allow you to do it through the manual tray. Okay. Then we go down here and we check, we choose use ICC profile. So there are, there are lots of other settings like driver matching, no colour correction and black and white photo. So there's all of those settings as well and the no colour correction is specifically there for when you're creating profiles because when I'm profiling a printer I don't want any colour correction. I want to read the raw data that's coming out of the printer. So you probably wouldn't use that for anything else. So driver matching is letting the Canon driver attempt to match the colour of the printer, but it's a bit like having an automatic setting on a camera. It'll give you a result, but not always the best one. Black and white photo. You can choose black and white photo from there. Or ICC profile. So we're going to choose using ICC profile. And even though we call it colour management, an ICC profile in a colour managed workflow will give you beautiful black and white prints. And in actual fact, it's a great way to see whether you've got a good profile or not. If you've got a black and white print and it's not pure black and white and it's got some colour casts through it, then you've got a, your profile's not right. So it should neutralise that, that colour. So we're going to choose use ICC profile. What have I done? I've gone back one, sorry. And then we need to select the profile. Now I've, I've printed on Ilford Gallery Prestige Metallic Gloss. It's a very glossy paper. Does that sort of make sense then why I've chosen the Canon glossy paper as my base? Because they're both glossy papers. So just there's two things we need to remember. We're choosing a base paper that was used to create the profile and then we're loading the profile that we've created for the media that we're using. And then last but not least, we have a thing called uh, rendering intent. And does anyone printing here understand, you know what rendering intents do? No? Anyone want to have a guess what? We've got two rendering intents here, perceptual and relative. There's actually four, but these are the two that relate to photographic printing. What's the best rendering intent to use? Okay, do I, anyone want to disagree with that? Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to suggest that there is no best rendering intent. It's the one that makes your image look the best or does the least change to your image. Essentially, if you cast your mind back to the screen where we had our colour gamuts, the rendering intent is really the way in which it's going to translate that colour from one gamut into another. So, if you cast your mind back, we had Adobe RGB in the wireframe and then we had a smaller colour gamut for the paper. The rendering intent determines how we're going to push that colour into that smaller space. So with perceptual, it's going to take all the colour that's out of it and then perceptually move it into that colour space. So it's going to move every colour in the tonal range. It's going to change everything. Whereas with relative, it's only going to change the colours that are out of gamut. So if you're printing on a paper and 99.9% .9 of your colour fits within the gamut and it's only got a remap 1%, relative may be a better option because it's only going to push those colours that are out to their closest match within the gamut. If you've got a file where most of it's out of gamut, or let's say half of it's out of gamut and half of it's in gamut, and we use perceptual, it's going to move all of the stuff that's outside of the gamut into the, into the gamut of the, of, the, of the paper, but the half that's in gamut, it's going to shift that as well to make room for the others. Does that make sense? Again, I'm really doing this in layman's terms. So what I suggest you do, there is a little, I can't walk in front of that screen, but if you look under my circle, there's a little checkbox. It says enable soft proofing. If you just tick between the two, you'll see the difference. And then you can have a look what, what it's doing. I did do a, a one of each with this and I left it on my desk. But what relative does, it gives me much brighter shadow areas than what perceptual does in this instance, because perceptual is moving everything in. 
all right? But I've printed on perceptual. I've printed all of these on perceptual. And I'm going to say 90% of what you do will be on perceptual, but you might find every once in a while you'll need to use relative. Black and white seems to work a little better on relative. But there's no rule. They're both right. Which one looks best? And that, isn't that, that's photography, isn't it? It's subjective. There is no right and wrong. You know, I did a print on a paper called a Washi Toronoko. It's like a Japanese rice paper of an image that I'll show you later. And I thought the result was a disaster. And I showed a, a colleague, a female photographer, and she goes, oh my God, give me a look at that. I love it. I hated it. She loved it. Who's right? Who's wrong? It's subjective. We're both right. Or we're both wrong, whatever. Okay, so I'll just run through the settings that we need to be aware of. So first of all, we need to make sure that we've got the right printer selected, okay? Then our media type. Now our media type is the type from the brand of the printer. We're selecting our base setting, if you like. Our paper size, the tray. Our print quality, I just jumped over that. There's, there's different levels of quality. When we're printing photographs, I always print on the highest quality. I want my photographs to be as good as they can be. Down under colour management, we set it to use ICC profile. We then load the monitor, the paper profile that we've created and we choose our rendering intent. It's jumped back to relative and that's only because I forgot to include this slide and I did it at a later date. So, so we just go through, we double check that all our settings are where we want them and then we hit print and it's as simple as that. It sounds complicated but you can save this as a setting. So once you've set it up, you only have to profile that paper once for that printer and it will work all the time. So once you've done it up, you could save this as a setting and call it Ilford, Gallery Prestige, Textured Cotton Rag or whatever you want to call it. And whenever you're printing to that paper, rather than have to think about all of that, you just go and click the default and it, and it loads it all for you. So most professional printing applications have the same settings. They should have them all, but they, they vary a little bit. But the major ones that we need are all there. So, so once you get your head around it, you should be able to print from any supporting software like Capture One, Lightroom, Photoshop, the software that comes with your printer. And I've just taken a screen grab of the Photoshop uh, print screen window with the same print to show you. So you'll see up the top, we've got Photoshop Manager's Colours and I've loaded the profile. All right? In the print settings up the top there, the very top, We've got the Canon printer. It's in those print settings where we'd load the base media and everything, but it's all there. So we have a window for our printer settings and a window for the colour management settings, but it's all there. So, before we start shooting some questions and I'll show you some print samples, there's a few points I want you to consider. First one is we will never match our screens 100%. Okay, there's this seems to be this misconception and, and it's amongst professional photographers too. You know, I go around, they go, I want my prints to match my screen perfectly. It's physically impossible. Who remembers colour slides? Okay, well your print, your, your screen's a bit like a colour slide, it's backlit. So your colours are always more saturated when it's backlit. A print is reflected, so that alone means they're never going to look the same. And what's the G word I told you about today? Damn it, exactly. So our screen, if you've got a, a, one of the BenQ monitors, it, it produces 99% of the Adobe RGB gamut. It's producing 99% of what our file is able to reproduce if we're working in an Adobe um, 1998 workflow, colour managed workflow. It's showing us 99% of the colour, but our print can't reproduce all that colour. So it's going to be a good rendition of that print in that colour space but it's not going to match it perfectly and we need to, we need to understand that. All right. Now what's the best paper to use? I get asked this all the time, Ian, what's the best paper? The ones you like the best. Exactly. And I say there is no such thing as the best paper. What you need to do is you need to look at what the paper is doing to your image, what you're trying to, it's subjective. All right. What you're trying to, what you're trying to do with the image, what you're trying to portray, what you're trying to project, then you pick the paper that best gives you that result. Okay? And I would look at things like tonality. So if I've got a really heavy, low key, black and white image with not a lot of detail in the shadows, I'm not going to print it on a matte stock because I'm going to lose that detail. If I've got a pastel print, it might look nice on a textured, uh, uncoated fine art paper. So it really depends on you and what you're trying to achieve. 
So what we might do is I'm just going to hand some things around. I've got two sets here. So can we... Oh, I've got to turn the lights on, don't I? Are they going to come on? So remember viewing conditions. These probably aren't the best viewing conditions. So I'm going to pass these around. I want you to have a look at them. I've got four identical pictures on four different papers. I just want you to have a look at what it does to things like skin tone, just one at a time, and we'll just as we go through. So have a look through those and then pass them back and we'll do the next one. So things like skin tone, shadow detail, um, contrast, it all changes dependent on, on what you're photographing. So I've tried to pick out of my little collection there some images that will give you a variety of uh, scenarios. So I've, I've got a black and white. There's only three here. I've got a black and white. I've got a colour landscape. I've got a pastel landscape. And I've got a portrait. Just a portrait we shot at one of the workshops that I did. Um, just so you can get an idea of what the different papers are going to do. So when you've had a look at them, if you want to just pass them back so that everyone can have a look. And then what we'll do is while you're looking at these, we'll go through and, and fire off, uh, you can fire off some questions. There you go. Ex excuse the glossy one. I've, stack, I've stacked them all on top of each other before they'll properly dry and it's got lots of dust spots on it. Uh, I wouldn't normally do that. I'd leave it out and let it dry a little bit longer. So thank you all for coming. Thank you, Canon, for, uh, for putting this on. I think it's really good if you guys are out there taking lots of photos that you seriously consider printing, whether you come here and print or whether you buy a printer and do it yourself, because it really is the end of the process. process. Photography always was about the finished print. It wasn't about having a pocket full of images that you never look at. You know, I've just redone my lounge room. I've got like a huge landscape prints and so forth on my, on my wall. And uh, people come around and go, oh, wow, they're fantastic. It's not, and I, I'm quite proud when people come and look at my photographs rather than keep them locked away on a website or in, on a hard drive somewhere never to see the light of day. So we've got, how are we going for time? We've still got a bit of time? 10 minutes? Yeah. So does anyone have any questions? It's a didgeridoo. Thanks. Um, I'm a visitor from Canada, so it's, uh, you have to bear with my uh, voice. That's okay. Um, when, I, when I printed in the dark room, I always made sure that I exposed for the, for the, the brightest light. Um, now, what do I do when I know that uh, the, the gamut of the paper is not going to cover the whole range of tonality. Do I expose more for the, move the histogram over to cover the, the dark area, or do I just let it fall in the middle? Okay, so there's, there's, a, there's a couple of things there. So one, you would, you would, you would alter your, your histogram, if you like, or the contrast ratio afterwards. But I believe with, so this, there was two schools of shooting when we shot film. If you're shooting colour transparency, you expose for the shadows. If you're shooting negative, you expose for the highlights. In digital, there's a term called shooting to the right. And everyone here familiar with what a histogram is on the back of your camera? So what you do is you look at your histogram and you get that information as far to the right as you can without clipping your highlights. That's the best exposure. The reason for that is the data distribution in a digital file isn't symmetrical, meaning the first stop isn't so if, let, to make it simple, let's say there's six stops tonal range, the first stop isn't one-sixth of the frame. The stop of the highlights is actually half the frame. The next stop is half of what's left. The next stop is half of what's left. So if you go down, there might only be one or two tones in your shadow area. So to sort of put that in real-world terms, if you underexpose by one stop, and what should be white in your frame is actually in the middle at 128, you've actually lost half of your tonal range. Now I'm going to clarify that and say that's if you're shooting in JPEG. 
If you're shooting in RAW, you can move your slider up. But that said, even in RAW, it's much, much better to get your exposure right in camera and not have to do that. That's just a safety net, okay? But I would always expose as far to the right as I can without clipping my highlights. In a RAW file, you can pull your highlights in. If you're shooting JPEG, once you've lost your highlight, it's gone. You'll never get it back. Does that answer your question? No worries. So someone else had a question over the back there? Um, would, would you comment on the different sorts of papers and what they're good for? Can I? Yeah, for sure. So um, as for those of you that have seen them, you'll notice there was a metallic paper which is really, really glossy. Uh, it's very, very popular. I'm not a fan of metallic paper. I find it a bit gimmicky, but I know people love it, so I just threw it in there because people do like it. If you want something to be really punchy and vibrant and colourful, you'd put it on a glossy stock. All right. There's also a shot there of, a, of the Beacon Cove Lighthouse. I've got one of those hanging in my house and it's printed on the matte stock that you see there. I actually like that because it's very, very subtle and I think it suits that image. All right. So I, I actually have three favourite papers and only two of them are here. All right, so there's textured cotton rag for my matte paper and gold fibre gloss, which is, there's one in there as well, which is a coated, it's called gold fibre gloss. It's a coated glossy stock, but not glossy like our metallic. It's glossy in the old world terms. Remember the photos that we got from our grandparents that, that, that were on cardboard and they had this beautiful finish to them? That was actually a glossy paper. To make them super gloss, they used to put them through a glazing machine and put them onto this hot roller to make them glossy. Before they, did, before they put it onto that glazer, the paper looked pretty much like that glossy paper does. That's my favourite paper for anything that I print, fine art, on a, on a coated stock. That paper has more tonality than any other paper I've seen and I've compared it with, with other brands and other papers within the Ilford stable and nothing comes close. So I would choose that, sorry? So do you choose anything particular if you were going to put it in um, some mirrored photos or something like that? Is it glass by glass by reflects a lot more? Yep. It's funny, you put them behind glass and they all look pretty much the same. <laughs> yeah, so, so there's glass out now um, called invisible glass and it's amazing. It's, it's expensive, but it's really good. And if you've got a nice fine art print and you want to display that, ask your framer to put invisible glass in it and you'll stand in front of it and there'll be no reflections. Come to an angle and you'll see reflections, but when you're looking straight at it, there's no reflections. Um, it's funny, what you've, got to, what you've got to look at is what the paper is doing to the tone, not what it's going to do behind glass. If you're printing on a matte stock and you're losing all of your uh, shadow detail, putting it behind glass is not going to bring that shadow detail back, but it's going to make it look glossier. All right. So at the end of the day, ignore the framing, have a look at what you want to get out of your print. And there's the, the shot of the Flinders Street Station ballroom there. There's so a lot of detail in there with the three windows, the black and white, a lot of detail in there. Have a look at the matte print and then have a look at the gold fibre gloss print and have a look at the difference in tonality. So if getting that tonal range out of your image is important, you wouldn't print that on a matte. If on the other hand, with that shot of the lighthouse, I really wanted to make that sea and sky a bit dreamy, I was quite happy to lose some shadow detail. I wanted the whole thing to be a lot softer. I prefer that one on, on the matte stock. The other paper, incidentally, that I've got in there is a Smooth Pearl, which is just your generic paper. So if you just want to do, you know, six by four snapshots to put in a photo album or in just a cheap frame on a mantelpiece, that's an ideal paper. It's a good compromise. Canon has the same type of paper. It's called Pro Luster, Canon Pro Luster, and it will do the same sort of thing. Either is good. The difference being is the way papers are made. Pa papers used to be made from pulp, photographic papers, from cotton rag or from beridium, with beridium coatings and so forth. All the modern papers that go through our photographic processes became what they called RC papers or resin coated papers. They were essentially plastic papers. So the Smooth Pearl and the Pro Luster are like a plastic paper. So they're, a, they're a, an easier paper to use. They're a lot less delicate. They won't scuff as easily. So they're good for sticking in albums and, and just doing, you know, six by fours to hand around and so forth. Ideal paper for that. So 
that's another thing that you may want to consider is where the print is being used. If I'm doing a, a set of six by fours from a holiday that I'm going to leave on the table for people to look at, I wouldn't do it on a, on a fine art paper because they're going to damage. They're not designed to be handled like that. They're de designed to be presented in a frame or in a mount. The, the Pro Luster or the Smooth uh, Pearl, they're designed to be handled. They don't fingerprint easily and so forth. So there's a whole lot of reasons why I choose a particular paper. But at the end of the day, that reason should really be up to the individual. So you as the artist, as the photographer, should choose the one that's best portraying your vision, I suppose. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. Um, black and white printing, if, if you were looking for as a neutral tone as you possibly could get from the printer, would you drop out um, the colour tone from the no. image in grayscale? Uh, no, 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 I wouldn't do that. I, um, so dropping, dropping your print to grayscale, what it's doing is it's removing the colour information from the file, but it's not considering the tonality of that colour. So the best way to produce a black and white print uh, very, very quickly without going into detail is to go into the photo, into image, and then black and white. And then what will happen is a dialog box will come up with all these colour sliders. Now when we used to shoot black and white on them and we wanted to make our blue skies really dark, we'd put a red filter on. Alright, is anyone familiar with that? You put a red filter on and what that would do uh, would make the sky on black and white film really, really dark. We can still do that in, in, with a raw file or with a, even with a JPEG using that black and white filter in Photoshop. But instead of thinking, okay, I want that, a red filter, ignore that. What colour's the sky? It's blue. So in those colour sliders, go to blue and adjust that. And you'll see the blue get darker or, br or brighter in terms, of, in terms of a black and white tone by adjusting it. So you have the control to adjust it. And there, what Photoshop have done is they've created that little uh, menu within it. The old prescribed way of creating a black and white print in Photoshop was if you just desaturate Okay, what you're doing is you're removing all the colour difference, all right? So if you can, they had a sample print which was a, a, about 20 paint pots open with the paint showing. And what they did was they just converted to grayscale and all those paints were completely different colours but tonally they were the same tone. So when you slid to grayscale, what happened to all the paints? It looked like we had 20 pots of the same colour paint which really didn't portray what we were trying to portray when we put it in black and white. But if you went into Photoshop and you created a duplicate layer, all right, and then you desaturated the duplicate layer so that we have that, so that all the pots look the same, but then you go into your blending mode and you change it to colour, boom, all of a sudden there's tonal difference between all the, po all the pots because it's now considering the colour information too. That's a, that was pretty hard for a lot of people to remember. So what they did in, in later versions of Photoshop, they introduced the black and white filter. Or not filter, conversion tool, whatever. What I will say is if you, how many people here shoot in RAW? If you want to get the best black and whites, use the black and white conversion at the RAW stage and use those colour sliders. All right, then you're going to get a better black and white because you're not dealing with pixels that have already been converted. All right. No worries. What I suggest to you is any other questions, if you go across the printer area, okay. you know, show them that the printer's what's involved. Mark from Canon will be over as well. Yep, beautiful. So other than that, I suggest, thank you very much for coming. Please thank you. Thank you.